everybody. Uh, welcome. It's, um, it's astonishing to realise that this is the penultimate session in um, our three semester long exploration of uh, the ideas of beauty, goodness and truth in months of as, uh, you know, as, as Bukowski says, uh, the days run away like wild horses over the hills. And it feels very much like this. It's just been and gone very quickly. Next week is the final event and uh, offering concluding reflections on the entire theme will be Noel Norton, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, Mike Williams, Director of the Changemaker Hub, and Sister Virginia Rodi, who kicked off the entire series back in February of 2018. And um, as if the uh, appeal of those speakers were not enough for you, we will also be having a lovely reception with the best wines and food this side of the SLP. <laughs> uh, today's session, therefore, is the, the final one exclusively devoted to the idea of truth. And when we last met, our focus was on the question of truth and lies in politics, and we will continue that theme today by thinking about the fate of truth in the current political climate, that climate in which um, Rudy Giuliani, bless his heart, could say, in all, serious, in all seriousness, truth isn't truth. Helping us to navigate our way around this vertiginous landscape, we have three of the college's best. Uh, Evan Crawford um, is assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations. He joined USD's faculty just last year. Dr. Crawford received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is a specialist on elections and voting behavior, state and local politics, and educational policy. Portions of his PhD dissertation entitled The Effective Electoral Rules on Participation, Competition, and Representation in Local Government have now appeared in journals such as Political Research Quarterly. Uh, Dal Dixon, a professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations received his PhD from USC and his JD from UCLA. He's been a member of the USD faculty since 1987. Among his many publications are two very important and well-regarded books, um, The Supreme Court in Conference, 1940s, 1985, was published by Oxford University Press and won the National Association of American Publishers um, Award as 2001's best book in government and political science. Professor Dixon's most recent book, uh, The People's Government, An Introduction to Democracy, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2014. And the third member of our, our panel is Kristen Moran, Professor of Communication Studies and Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. Having received a BA from USD itself, she earned her PhD from the University of Washington. Dr. Moran's research focuses on Spanish language media in the United States, Mexico, and Spain, with special attention to the role media play in the identity development of children and adolescents. Her book, Listening to Latino Youth, Television Consumption Within Families, was published in 2011 by Peter Lang. Thank you so much, um, all three of you, for joining us today. And please give our speakers here a very warm welcome. Thank you. I do have a few slides. Um, I was told slides were optional, but uh, I, still, I still work with a crutch, um, and I consider them my crutch, so uh, indulge me, please. Um, so there are three aspects to this topic that I specifically at the moment am most interested in. Um, and the first is being kind of our, as a populace, our collective ability to even define what a lie is in the first place. Uh, the second being the elements and structure of a particular type of lie that I'd like to talk about. And the third being how we can understand the public's receipt of these lies or rejection of them. So while the policy space that exists for lies uh, to foment is vast 
and certainly not restricted to just a post-2016 time period. I am going to focus on just one specific area uh, that I would argue is at least as concerning as any other, if not the most concerning. Um, and bias alert, it also coincides with what I happen to study. So that, again, could be part of why I'm so worried about it. Um, and that is with respect to our faith in the democratic process uh, via free and fair elections. Uh, before I get to that, though, I do want to note um, on the trouble that we have calling something a lie. Um, and I don't mean calling something not true and characterizing it as not true, but actually using the word lie. Uh, so when we think about lying in politics, a recent flashpoint, often carried out in the Twitterverse or online message boards, has been not only about the presence of a lie, but the language you use to characterize it. For example, a recent rally in Green Bay, Wisconsin, President Trump criticized Democratic Governor Tony Evers in an effort to suggest that Evers was protecting doctors in the following scenario, quote, the baby is born, the mother meets with the doctor, they take care of the baby, they wrap the baby beautifully, and then the doctor and the mother determine whether or not they will execute the baby, end quote. The media's coverage of this statement ran the gamut, and one of the more criticized responses was, was the New York Times tweet and their characteriz characterization of Trump's statement um, as in a, quote, inaccurate refrain was the way they, they talked about this. And this is but just one of many examples where the use of the word lie uh, in and of itself becomes the focal point that we talk about, whether or not we say the word lie, right? Um, and it's a contestation between those who prefer this binary world where something is true or it is a lie, or those who are comfortable in kind of seeing uh, truth on a continuous spectrum, right? Where lie is at one end, absolute truth on the other, and then we have in between falsehoods, misleading statements, exaggerations, half-truths. What's more, when classifying something as a lie, a question you could ask is, must the accuser demonstrate ill intent on the part of the supposed liar, right? Or is willful ignorance or plausible deniability of the facts enough to graduate that accused from the ranks of liar to just misspoken or misunderstood? The discussions and debates that play out most frequently and get the most attention in the mainstream media are not necessarily the sensational conspiracy-laden extremes. Think Pizzagate or 9-11 truthers, things that are maybe more readily rejected by at least the vast majority of the population. But rather, it's the subtle lie. And I don't use the word subtle as an adjective to describe the seriousness of it, but rather kind of the way in which it enters our space, right? Um, and this, this subtle lie, this narrative, is one that begins with a grain of truth. So it is these statements that are the most difficult to combat and perhaps most deserving of our efforts to do so. So I'd like to provide two examples that are representative of different aspects of the subtle lie before getting into ways in the second part of, of my talk about how social science can inform us about how the public is, is receiving all of this information. I do not pretend that these encompass uh, the exhaustive category of, of lies that we see in politics or even what we see today, but they are what is currently standing out to me. Uh, so the first type has the goal of fomenting some kind of fear or pessimism, and not necessarily fear about like physical violence or things we might traditionally be, quote, afraid of, but something more under the, under the surface that could have long-term consequences. And in this scenario, the speaker does not create a lie out of thin air but rather take some kernel of information generated elsewhere, process it through their own filter, and spits it out in some synthesized nugget, and, and often in the case now, a tweet. Uh, so if you review Twitter, Facebook, online message boards, we would see this behavior exercised by countless individuals, right? Thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. But not many of those people have the ability to amplify their take to a mass audience. To the extent that our political leaders lie to us, should be of extra concern, if for no other reason, and there are many reasons why that would be concerning, but if for no other reason than the sheer size of the audience that they can command. And uh, when this lie zeroes in on our faith in the democratic process, so when the content of the lie shifts towards don't trust democracy, don't trust the election results, this is when we can have some problems. So back in January, Texas Secretary of State uh, Whitley announced that his office had discovered 95,000 non-citizens registered to vote. 
and that 58,000 of them had voted at least once over the last 18 years. Uh, the Secretary of State stated that these data resulted from a year-long investigation in which names were provided by the Texas Department of Public Safety, which is essentially a DMV, and they matched those names against a state database of voters. This announcement came and it renewed warnings from prominent leaders about the threat of voter fraud. Texas Attorney General tweeted, quote, voter fraud alert, and promised to deploy an election fraud unit that he created last year, that he would spare no effort in assisting with these troubling cases. The governor of Texas described the news as evidence of, quote, illegal vote registration. And President Trump weighed in with a tweet as well. 58,000 non-citizens voted in Texas, with 95,000 non-citizens registered. These numbers are just the tip of the iceberg all over the country, especially in California. Voter fraud is rampant, must be stopped, strong voter ID. So the problem with all of these reactions is that this wasn't true, right? Um, just, it, it just wasn't. And so what do we do with this, right? Um, well, how do we get to this place in the first place, right? How do, how do we get to this, to this level? Well, the, the nuance is many in Texas, non-citizens do have legal driver's licenses. Um, driving records in Texas typically state citizen status, but many individuals who were not citizens when they got their license would later become citizens. They would be naturalized. But you don't update your, your driver's license, right? You don't take that special trip to the DMV until it's time to renew. So it's not like when you update your citizenship status that your driver's license is going to have that information. So driver's records are not updated uh, at the same time. So if out-of-state driver data is cross-referenced with a list of registered voters, it would show incorrectly that a registered voter is not a citizen. So thankfully, coming to the rescue, were professionals who are actually tasked with running our elections. These are local officials in Texas quickly realized many of the names that they were sent to check were actually naturalized citizens. In fact, El Paso's list included a woman who works at the elections office and whose colleagues threw her a citizenship party when she became a citizen in 2017. Now, just this week, Texas announced that it was ending its inquiry and it retracted its initial claims. As of this morning, the president has yet to comment on that particular update. But what this is, is a case of bureaucratic administration, relatively boring that we would never ever even think about or pay attention to, right? And we, we take it for granted that local officials have voter lists and we assume everything is working correctly. And in actually this case, everything was working correctly. There wasn't any cause for alarm. So in this case, a fictional problem was generated and there was no need for a solution. But the question that we might ask ourselves is to what extent has the damage been done, right? How much toothpaste can we put back in the tube? Government officials suggesting that non-citizens are voting in large numbers is one way to undermine our faith in the electoral process. Another way is to, rather than make up a problem, is to deny the reality of an actual problem. The highlights of the Mueller report according to the majority of the press, coverage upon its release, centered around either coordination or obstruction of justice. And coming in a distant third in the media coverage is what actually appeared on page one, which was this. The Russian government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in sweeping and systematic fashion. Evidence of Russian government operations began to surface in mid-2016. So this was not a new conclusion. Uh, in fact, the clear evidence, according to our own intelligence agencies, was that Russia did interfere in the elections. So the, this was the impetus behind the special counsel investigation in the first place, was that we knew prior to the election that the, Rus the Russian government was engaging in interference. There was no statements about the nature of it, and that was the purpose, right? So when the reality of a situation has the potential to threaten the legitimacy of those in power, or at least their perceived legitimacy, then maybe we wouldn't be surprised if the reaction of those in power is to deny that reality, or at least to downplay it. So President Trump stated a couple of times, as evidenced here, uh, Deputy AG Rod Rosenstein has stated at the news conference, there is no allegation in the indictment that any American was a knowing participant in this illegal activity. There is no allegation in the indictment that the charged conduct altered the outcome of the 2016 election. And that's absolutely correct. That is absolutely correct. The problem is that there has been little suggestion that the vote count was affected 
That was not the aim of the Mueller investigation. In fact, scholars have been over backwards to discuss how difficult it would be to show in the first place that votes were changed or that the outcome was altered. And it certainly, again, was not the purpose and the scope of the investigation. This would seem to be a case then of the president moving the goalpost and claiming victory. According to the New York Times, in a meeting this year, Mick Mulvaney, the White House Chief of Staff, made it clear to then Secretary Nielsen that President Trump equated any discussion of Russian election activity with questions about the legitimacy of his victory. And according to one senior administration official, Mr. Mulvaney said it wasn't a great subject and it should be kept below his level. So on the one hand, we have stories that are dubious at best being amplified by our leaders. And in other cases, very real security concerns that are being given less priority than they otherwise should. So how does the public make sense of this? All these messages are transmitted to the public. So can we sift through the wreckage? Can we arrive at some common understanding of truth? I do not know. I do not have an answer to that question. But political scientists, communication scholars, sociologists, social psychologists actively try to understand what happens in the public. Many of the findings thus far provide some reason for optimism, but also cause for concern. A couple of recent examples of work done in this area make the use of survey experiments and uh, the use of fake news and people's ideas of what fake news is. So a Knight Foundation study surveyed 2,000 people and they presented them with a dozen different news headlines. They were split into three groups. One control group, they only got the headline. That's all they were given. Then a treatment group got a headline plus a green or a red indicator that suggested that professionals had coded the, so the validity of the source as being a legitimate journalistic uh, organization or not. Right? The good news is that the green stories were perceived as more accurate than the red not valid stories. And I'll give you a couple of just examples here. So again, from my crutch, this is um, some, that, again, there were a dozen stories here, but as an example, the control group would get a headline that looked like this on the left, outlook for growth of world economy gets even rosier. Um, and then the treatment group would get the exact same thing, but they are told that the new source rating is green, meaning that the, the journalistic approach to reporting this met standards, et cetera, right? Um, and then there was a third treatment where there was the exact same thing, and if they wanted to, they could even click for more info about who is this new source and get, get that information, right? As an example of uh, a red source rating, um, again, all the same headlines, but they would see, oh, the new source rating here is a red, meaning maybe I shouldn't trust this source or it doesn't follow the standards, okay? But again, there was about a dozen different headlines that were randomized to all these individuals, some pro-left, pro some pro-right uh, headlines, okay? So, the uh, perceived accuracy of these. So they were asked, how accurate do you think this is on a scale of one to five? Five being very accurate, one being not at all accurate, right? So on green rated stories, um, given no cue whatsoever, a little bit more than, you know, three out of five, a little bit more than accurate. And what we saw, which we would expect, is when they were told, hey, this comes from a legitimate news source, then they are more likely to believe that is an accurate story. When they are presented with it, which is actually a, a red false, uh, false story, right? Um, and they are told this is not a great source, right? Their, their belief that it is accurate goes down. So this is all as we would expect, right? Um, now, is there a partisan bent to this? You can probably guess, yes, there is. So if, if respondents are presented with a left-leaning story that is red-rated, ra red meaning this is a good for Democrats story, but we're also telling you the news source isn't very valid, right? Democrats, more likely to believe it's accurate than Republicans. Again, that's probably what we would expect. If we give them that cue, right? Oh, sorry, I'll go over to this, to this one. It's the same thing, it's the mirror opposite over here, right? If we give a right-leaning, this is good for Republican story, but we're also telling you the news source isn't great, right? Republicans are more likely than Democrats to believe it's true. So we just have a, a mirror opposite reaction, right? If we provide them with the cue, <clears throat> meaning, hey, this is red rated, right? This source maybe shouldn't be believed, then the accuracy, the perceived accuracy goes down. They're responding to that information, right? To the legitimacy of the news source. The same thing is true for both Democrats and Republicans, whether it's a left-leaning story, and again, or a right-leaning story, right? So what does this tell us? It tells us that voters, or I, I'm used to saying voters in surveys. Um, it tells us that these respondents, when they're given some piece of information that says the source of what that headline is you read 
has gone through the journalistic standards, they're responding in the way we would maybe think or hope, right, that they would, okay? Um, a completely separate study um, that has come out at the same time from Brendan Nyan at Dartmouth. Um, again, a couple of thousand respondents, and they uh, presented news to them, either that was completely fake, and their definition of fake news here is they literally made, thing, made things up out of nowhere. There was no basis in it whatsoever. Um, uh, they also had what they called hyper-partisan news. So again, there's truth there, but it is spun in a very obviously partisan way. And then, quote, real news, which is straight reporting, as you might expect, okay? And they also presented to these respondents in either a congenial fashion or an uncongenial fashion, which is how you might expect the adjectives that they use um, are nicely presented, even if they're being very spinny, right, or very bitter, okay? Um, so what's the good news, bad news? Well, the good news is people are spotting fake news, and they're not likely to rate it very accurate, right? Um, but they are more likely to rate it accurate if it's presented to them in a nice way, right? Okay. Um, and what's interesting is they actually viewed hyperpartisan news with the same amount of accuracy. So things that were completely made up, they viewed with the same legitimacy as things that actually were, had basis in truth but just were really spun well, right? So is this good? Is this bad? What level? I mean, ideally, we wouldn't want anyone to believe fake news, right? But I don't, you know, it's hard to know what to compare this to. Now, maybe concerning, though, is when we present them with real news, they do view it as more accurate, but they don't crack even somewhat accurate. And this is real news, right? So this is kind of where I leave on a little bit of a pessimistic tone, which is this idea of if we are, if the effect of being lied to or even if we think we're being lied to and we're not really, that might not matter, right? Maybe it's just our perceptions that matter. If we think we're being lied to, uh, on the one hand, maybe we're more uh, skeptical, right? So we, we treat fake news the way it should be treated. But on the other hand, maybe we're even more skeptical of real news too, right? And we're less likely to believe things that are, are true. This, for me, in my area of what I study, gets most concerning when we're talking about elections. And what I go back to at the beginning, which is to the extent that if we get to a point where we do not believe that the election we just had is legitimate. That is a big, big problem. And any of the other stories about whether we believe these other sensational ideas might not matter so much, right? So that's my rosy outlook that I will leave <laughs> dealt with. Thank you. I do not have a PowerPoint because I'm a Luddite. So it just, it does not work for me, so apologies. And it won't be the last time I apologize uh, in, in my talk. Before I begin, uh, I just want to say one or two words uh, of introduction. Uh, and I just want to say how happy I am to be here with, with, uh, with the Humanities Center. These events are always the best. They're always interesting. Uh, you always ask the best questions. The, you have insightful comments. And it's just, it's a pleasure to be here always. Uh, so with that in mind, here we go. I was asked to talk about modern politics, truth and lies. And that is what I'm going to do. Uh, the truth has never had an easy time of it. Uh, but liars have never had it so good. Uh, there was a song from Avenue Q that says the internet is for porn. Uh, but that was before the rise of Facebook and uh, Twitter and uh, presumably Skynet. Uh, and today, a ginormous chunk of the internet, that part that we call social media, uh, it's for lying. And uh, no one exploits that space, uh, the Twitterverse, better than the current resident of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And that will be kind of the leitmotif of my talk, but I am not going to concentrate solely on that. In 1859, C.H. Spurgeon complained that a lie goes around the world before the truth can get its boots on. And that was using 18th century technology. Uh, it's, uh, it's never been more true than the information age, where social science studies consistently show that lies spread farther and faster than the truth by orders of magnitude. Uh, now, it doesn't help truth's cause that lies are relatively simple, they're straightforward, and they're often attractive. Uh, will a lie uh, sorry, well, the truth is complex, controversial, and uncertain. A lie is a lie is a lie, but the truth is uh, confusing, controversial, and it comes in strange guises. And I want to touch on that just for a couple of seconds. It doesn't help that there are at least two major forms of truth. There's capital T, objective truth, and lowercase subjective truth. Uh, the former, as you know, is Plato's realm. Plato anticipates the X-Files by 2,000 years by proclaiming the truth is out there and waiting for us to be discovered. Uh, absolute objective truth 
uh, can be deceptively treacherous. Uh, it's the realm not only of Platonic philosophy, but dogmatic religion and the natural sciences. Uh, it can be faith-based, it can be evidence-based, and it can be found in theory through prayer, contemplation, reason, or rigorous scientific testing. It's a complicated business, this objective truth. Uh, subjective truth is, is way worse. Uh, if you want simplicity, this is not for you. Uh, subjective truth belongs to Protagoras, who said, uh, man is the measure of all things. He anticipated relativism, classical liberalism, and Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon. Uh, subjective truth is inherently squishy, it's uncertain, and it might be illusory. If truth is subjective, then perspective is everything. It's the difference between these two truths that's why Rudy Giuliani's claim, which is kind of the theme of, of today, that truth isn't truth, it actually doesn't bother me much. Uh, had he written it out, at least we'll sober, uh, I suspect he would have used lowercase t the first time and capitalized it the second time, and he would have been absolutely correct. Truth isn't truth. Uh, Kellyanne Conway's infamous catchphrase, alternative facts, is more troublesome, but it's only because she was clearly lying when she said it. Uh, but what she said is defensible in the abstract, at least, because people can and do use facts differently. They weight them differently, and they come to different, although equally defensible, conclusions. So uh, I'm inclined to give Giuliani and Conway a pass, at least for this one. But for me, the fact remains that if lying is a superpower, their boss is Superman. Uh, according to the Washington Post, uh, President Trump has now broken the 10,000 lie mark. He's lied 10,000 demonstrable times between Inauguration Day and today. Uh, that's an average of 12 times a day. Uh, they note that he picked up the pace over the last 200 days and has been telling an average of 22 whoppers per day. Uh, for those of you who are old enough, these are Joey Suzu Hall of Fame numbers. So that is what we're dealing with. Now, I'm as baffled as anybody, and if somebody can explain it, I'll be happy to listen. Uh, I'm as baffled as anybody with his utter estrangement from the truth. And it, it's just kind of depressing. Uh, so I apologize in advance because that's my topic. Uh, I'm going to try to answer three quick questions. Number one, why do politicians lie? Two, why do we believe them? And three, is President Trump uh, just another politician, or is he different in kind or in degree? First, why do politicians lie? They have their reasons. Uh, they range from the noble to the self-interested, short-term prevarications to long-term strategic lies and myth-making. Going down the ladder, from the more noble to the more profane, here are seven good reasons why politicians lie. First three are uniquely political. The last four, politicians use them, but so does everybody else, except us. Uh, number one, to protect the national interest in a dangerous world. Diplomacy and espionage require lying. Uh, and it's done for the best of motivations to protect the national interest, national security, where literally millions of lives can be at stake. Second, to achieve domestic policy goals for the common good. This involves lying in the interest of deal making domestically uh, in a comparatively partisan environment in order to do the best you can for your city, your county, your state, or your country. Third, to gain a partisan or electoral advantage. We all know party politics is a full contact sport and lying is no different from a misdirection play in football. It's just kind of part of the game, at least within limits. That is politics. Fourth, uh, we lie to gain personal power for personal and career goals. This is lying to secure self-advancement uh, in your career. Climbing the greasy pole isn't easy, and it doesn't matter whether you're in politics or business or academics. We all try to do it, and sometimes we need to be economical with the truth. Fifth, self-aggrandizement. We sometimes lie to make ourselves look good or feel good in the interest of self-esteem and ego enrichment. I've been known to do that occasionally. Uh, sixth, civil corruption. We lie to seek illegal or unethical personal enrichment. And finally, criminal corruption. We lie to commit or cover up crimes to evade exposure, arrest, and prosecution. Machiavelli, the master of politics. Uh, you can't talk about politics and lying without mentioning Machiavelli. 
Uh, he tells us that lying is an inherent part of politics. To get, to keep, to use power effectively, you need to be clever, and that includes lying. But Machiavelli has two corollaries to keep in mind. Good politicians should only lie when necessary. In other words, there should be a clear political purpose for it. And second, if you need to lie, you should be good at it. That's the clever bit. Uh, this momentarily leads to a preview of the second part, actually the third part of my argument. I don't think that Donald Trump is a conventional politician, and, and so I just want to say that uh, off the bat. But before I get to that, I'm, I'm going to go back to my second question. If politicians lie, and it's an inherent part of politics, why do we believe them? And I have something to say about that, as it turns out. First, uh, we often don't have the information that we need to judge what the politicians are telling us. Governments, even democratic ones, often withhold or redact crucial information, and it makes it relatively easy for politicians to hide the ball. Uh, on this note, thank God for a free press, uh, because it's our saving grace when ensuring that government is transparent, often against its will, and that is something healthy democracies require. Second. Uh, we might be too trusting, naive, ill-informed, or dumb to realize we're being lied to, and that's on us. Third, we might realize that we're being lied to, but for whatever reason, we don't care. That's on us, too. Fourth, we often piously claim to value truth over, over other virtues, but that might be the biggest lie of them all. As it turns out, there are lots of things that we prefer to the truth, especially in politics. We like the idea of truth far more than we like the truth itself, and we often at least implicitly demand that our politicians lie to us. We recoil from truths we don't want to hear, and we readily embrace lies that reassure and console us. Uh, any politician who tells the truth about raising taxes or cutting benefits probably won't be around for long. Any politician who limits their promises to things that they realistically expect to accomplish in four years, they won't be around long. We not only like, but effectively demand to be told that our problems are A, not our fault, B, easily fixable within the next four years, or C, like climate change, they're irrelevant and they don't matter. Uh, they can be safely ignored. We like our comforting national and democratic myths. We like to be told that we're unique and we're the best. America and Americans are the greatest, and we are blessed to live in a city on the hill. I like that. Uh, we eat flattery for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Any politician who doesn't pander to or lavish compliments on their constituents probably won't be around long. I might have done that just a little bit at the beginning of my talk. M maybe. And I'm hoping that at the end of it, Brian Clack says something very nice about my speech. And I am going to be graceful enough to believe him. <laughs> uh, finally, some liars thrive because they're entertaining. Uh, we know that they're lying, but it doesn't matter. It's part of their charm. Uh, we love carny barkers. I do. Tellers of tall tales, magicians, historical fiction, uh, even the gross manufactured fantasy that we, for some reason, call reality TV. Uh, the list of entertaining liars who've made good in America is pretty endless, uh, and most of us enjoy it. We enjoy the escapism, especially when the reality that we live in isn't going so well. And this, of course, is a big part of the president's charm. He's entertaining. Uh, and certainly his base finds him to be wildly entertaining, uh, no matter what. So is Donald Trump another lying politician, maybe a little bit more profligate or shameless and, and certainly more entertaining than most? Uh, is it a difference in degree or kind? And as I foreshadowed, I, I kind of argue that Donald Trump, and this is part of his charm and it's part of his attraction, he's not really a politician in a conventional sense at all. Uh, it, it's, it's a difference in kind. And it comes down to his background. He's really a salesman. He's not a politician. He's completely bored by public policy and diplomacy. He's, really, he's a real estate developer and is very upfront about it. He's a TV personality. And he's a relentless promoter of the Trump brand. Uh, and that's really the only way you can understand what he says and does on a day-to-day -day basis. You cannot understand Donald Trump by reading Machiavelli or the canon of politics and government. He can be understood by reading The Life of P.T. Barnum, Elmer Gantry, maybe watching Glen Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross, or The Music Man. He is a salesman, and that is, that is his it. Uh, the convergence of the forces that got Donald Trump interested in politics and led him to the White House really begins with the merger 
of the political and entertainment worlds in the 1970s. Uh, you may remember, you can look up Wally George and George Putnam, people like that. Uh, they were the pioneers of polytainment, and they were the forerunners of people like Rush Limbaugh and Alex Jones's Infowars. And they made a fortune acting as outrageous political provocateurs. Uh, they were really, at, at the end of the day, they were self-promoters posing as political commentators. They were entrepreneurs kind of uh, exploiting political outrage and outrage politics to make a buck. Politics was their hook, but not their product. It was always about promoting their personal brand and their product lines. Uh, I looked up just uh, in a couple of seconds, Alex Jones's Infowars. You Google Alex Jones Infowars, the second listing is Infowars products. Uh, and that is the point. They found a new way to monetize a cult of personality, and that is one reason to get into politics. Another reason why I don't think President Trump can be understood as a conventional politician <laughs> is that there often is no real political point or purpose to the lies beyond kind of making himself look good and other people look bad, which again is understandable, but it's not really political. Uh, his stories change from day to day and they're often inconsistent, if not contradictory, uh, but that comes with being a salesman, not a politician. He is really to be understood, I think, as a stream of consciousness performance artist, He's winging it most of the time. There's no clear political purpose to the pattern, no strategic thought to it. Uh, in a moment of candor, he admitted that the lies he tells, uh, even the most transparent ones, are essential to selling the Trump brand. I play to people's fantasies, he said. People want to believe that something is the biggest and the greatest and the most spectacular. It's an innocent form of exaggeration and it's a very effective form of promotion. Don Trump is not a particularly good liar, again, in the Machiavelli sense. His lies tend to be easily disproved, easily discredited, and even his base supporters readily acknowledge that, that this is so. But they enjoy the show, and they're happy to uh, suspend disbelief accordingly. So what does this mean? And I have bad news and then not so bad news. Uh, first, it's taken Donald Trump a couple of years, but he's gotten rid of the people around him, staff advisors, senior political appointees, uh, who stood up to him or at least refused to enable his more reckless instincts. Uh, he's always disparaged the presidency, that is, the, the administration around him, his uh, executive organization, and has emphasized himself, the president, as the only person whose opinion matters. And now, for the next two years, it looks like he will more or less have his wish. So we're going to see what happens when he has senior staff and advisors who are no longer inclined to tell him the truth or push back against unwise, unethical, uh, or illegal orders. We're going to see the administration grow less institutionalized, more sensitive to the president's whims, for better or for worse, and we will see what happens. Uh, it is true, I think, that, that the environment in which we live now, it has lowered the moral and ethical standards in government. It certainly coarsened our political dialogue, although he's far from the only person uh, that we can blame for that. He's deepened the, uh, the partisan divide. He's undermined public confidence in government, eroded the integrity of our political institutions, damaged our international reputation and our traditional global alliances. All of those good things that honesty and integrity get you. Uh, again, this is something that maybe a conventional politician might do, but not without a compelling reason, and frankly, I don't see one. Uh, from the could-be-worse department, uh, there is a silver lining here. Uh, because President Trump is not a conventional politician, uh, he still has no clear idea what he wants to do or how he wants to do it, uh, beyond pushing the Trump global, uh, global brand. Uh, there is no st clear strategic purpose to what he does. He changes his mind seemingly uh, day to day, and it's because he never really makes his mind up in the first place. He has very little in the sense of worldview, uh, doctrine, guiding principles, uh, no clear sense what he wants to do beyond kind of what amounts to a few simplistic bumper sticker slogans. He does have a vision, but it's almost entirely negative. He knows what he hates. And he knows what he wants to blow up, but he's much less clear on what he wants to build in its place. He's a real estate developer who's more interested in demolition than construction. One policy constant that he stays true to is his border wall. 
And even that seems to be an outlet for his need to build something tangible that the world's most powerful real estate developer can put his name on. Uh, finally, from the, the also it could be worse department, uh, the use of lies to bend reality to one's will and a rejection of evidence-based politics is still largely limited to the White House. Uh, the 10,000 lies have not yet become institutionalized. Uh, this is not for lack of trying. President Trump has actively sought to compromise uh, every executive agency, including those that are traditionally independent, like the Federal Reserve, the Government Accountability Office, and the Justice Department. But despite these efforts, our political institutions have remained largely evidence-based and for the most part still respect due process and the rule of law. The fact that uh, President Trump has not done more damage to our government institutions so far is encouraging. The longer he stays in office, however, the closer we might get to finding out what happens when the truth becomes what the leader says it is and changes according to the needs of the moment. Someone should write a book about that. And that is all I have to say. So thank you. Thank you for those um, two talks, which I hope will sort of frame what I'm going to talk about as well. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this series and have enjoyed listening to my colleagues throughout the semester offering various understandings of truth. As a media studies scholar who investigates representation and identity, I'm often faced with questions about accuracy or reality. Do the media portray things accurately? Is this show or that realistic? Of course, the answer is always no. There is only representation, and that while representation impacts what audiences or more, more broadly society thinks is true, truth is always negotiated within ideology. So as I thought about today's presentation and its title, I assumed I was assigned the lies part, and as such, I focused on journalism, or what has recently been attacked as an enemy of the people for contemporary politicians. Listening to popular discourse about journalism today, there appears to be an assumption that somehow the current political landscape has changed the practice of journalism to make it less trustworthy than in the past. And while the speed of sharing information has been, a, has been catalyzed by social media and other platforms, the fundamental model of journalism is not changing. In my opinion, one of the main problems of the nature of journalism in the United States is not a result of the current political rhetoric, nor Trump's attack on the fourth estate, but rather a consequence of the commodification of information that follows an economic model that promotes sensationalism over substance with roots in the late 19th century. If we think back to the era of yellow journalism, the public distrust in news was high. The model of the penny press was to sell as many papers as possible, and to do so, the most outrageous stories sold enticing advertisers to spend more and publishers to do more of the same. The current system, competing voices yelling for your attention, has created a new era of yellow journalism. But it's easy to make distinctions between truth and lies when there's actually a difference. Some news stories are made up, that's fake news. But what the general public is mostly exposed to is something much less obvious and perhaps much more problematic. Frankly, expecting truth from journalism may lead us to ask the wrong questions. In 1922, Walter Lippmann, an American journalist, warned that the news and truth were not compatible ideas. Journalism works towards accuracy, which is tied to objectivity and verification of facts, but that is not truth. Truth is contingent on the relationship between those facts, which may or may not be accurate, and people's perceptions. Narratives can be created from the stories that are told, but the negotiation between the audience's subjectivity and the story is what makes the truth, or at least perpetuates the idea of what is more or less true. For a number of reasons, including the, including the fundamental belief in our democratic foundation, we have been seduced into thinking that somehow journalism will stand apart from other literary forms and provide a set of objective facts that will give us a, a sense of what happened, what might happen, and what it means. But that's not how it works. Journalism shouldn't be studied by asking questions within the binary of truth and lies. That is superficial at best. News is a cultural institution that shapes ideology. It is a system of rituals and conventions that function to produce meaning and maintain authority as a voice for truth. The First Amendment is often evoked as a way to ensure that journalists have the freedom to do their job to support an active democracy. But the First Amendment makes no mention of truth 
or accuracy or other rules about what that freedom entails. In fact, recent Supreme Court decisions often protect free speech, even when it can be dangerous, whether or not on some level it might be true, or at least not libelous. Practically, the First Amendment became the backdrop for the rise of advertiser-supported journalism, an opportunity that would distinguish news of the US from European socialism that tolerated a more cozy relationship between the government and journalists, but where journalism was envisioned as a public good rather than a commodity. The rise of the era of yellow journalism gives us insight into the first wave of fake news and hypersensationalism. Papers like the New York Journal and the New York World pitted William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer against each other to gain the most readers. The penny press was the backdrop for the demise of truth in journalism, and not surprisingly, trust in journalism plummeted. Although the New York Times strategy was to rise above the sensationalism of yellow journalism by focusing on objective stories that would be free of bias and ensure accuracy, the legacy of the myth of objectivity is what has led to this torrid relationship between journalism and truth. Fundamentally, while the New York Times was perfecting all the news that, is fit, that was fit to print, the economic model that would sustain this industry was still based on getting the consumers to the product. The need to please advertisers disguised the public good nature of journalism. A public fourth estate would require public policies and public investment, but what we see instead was the rise of a private investment into the media sector. While this might seem intuitively beneficial, since the press serves as a watchdog, it really didn't pan out that way. While journalism scholars have been critical of the press's ability to live up to the fourth estate ideals, they were also concerned that the public would not be able to interpret and use information in ways that would be in society's best interest. In fact, Edward Bernays and Walter Lippmann propagated the idea that without media manipulation, people would not be able to govern themselves as out outlined by democratic norms. The elite needed to control the means of production of information so that citizens wouldn't get confused. Facts needed to be arranged to create the preferred view of reality. This manipulation of information was seen as a way to protect democracy. In Lippmann's book, Liberty in the News, first published in 1920, he warned that journalism was being practiced by untrained accidental witnesses. He wanted journalism to have more professionalism. This seems to eerily foreshadow today's behavior, but more on that in a minute. By the 1940s, the Hutchins Commission was formed to make recommendations about the role of media in a modern democracy. And in 1947, the commission concluded that ownership trends moved the press away from the public interest and suggested watchdog groups over the press itself to ensure more ethical conduct. Private news was seen as serving its economic interests rather than the public's. And there was a fear that without oversight, the press could mislead and emphasize sensational stories <clears throat> rather than those significant to democracy. OK, but what about the protections in the law? Aren't journalists legally obligated to tell the truth? How do we protect the public from lies? The First Amendment relies on the assumption that the widest distribution of information from diverse and antagonistic sources is essential to a wel to welfare of civic life. The government is therefore restricted from limiting speech and the free flow of ideas. The public benefits from access to a variety of sources that have different viewpoints. Truth emerges from debate, or so the saying goes. Because we hold free speech in such high regard, there are very few restrictions on journalists. Libel is not protected speech, and the best defense for any journalist is always truth. But the court casts a wide net when discovering and applying the standard. Precedence for US libel law has made it exceedingly difficult to hold news organizations accountable for news, report, news reports that may include false information. In fact, the actual malice standards set through the infamous um, New York Times v. Sullivan case protects journalists who may indeed pu publish falsities, but did not have reckless disregard for the truth. The spirit of the standard comes from the statement in the, de in the decision that says, only a free and unrestrained press can effectively ex expose deception in government, end quote. And while the intention of holding government accountable through a fee free and rigorous press is laudable, it opens the door for mistakes and half-truths as long as the intent is honorable. Further, when mistakes happen in the initial coverage of an issue, there is little incentive for retraction. And it's almost impossible to correct any misperceptions that may have already been in the public sphere. 
So in fact, the actual malice standard protects journalists but may sacrifice truth. In practice, it's actually more common to read stories that are misleading but not necessarily false. Do you all remember the McDonald's hot coffee lawsuit and the jury award? This was a story repeated in the news media across the US and became emblematic of other narrative devices circulating throughout pop culture about big business and frivolous lawsuits. In 1992, Stella Leibach went, to, went through a McDonald's drive through with her grandson and ordered coffee. In the parking lot, it spilled. She suffered third degree burns. The coffee was 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Prior to this, McDonald's had received over 700 complaints in the previous 10 years about the coffee temperature, and they ignored them. When Stella requested that McDonald's pay her medical expenses and her loss of wages, about $20,000, they only offered 800. This led to trial. So the jury found McDonald's guilty and ordered that the corporation pay $2.9 million in punitive damages. But in fact, they didn't, she didn't get $2.9 million, right? They settled for a much less um, amount, 600,000. This is a great story, dramatic, the little guy won, but this type of litigation and this settlement is incredibly rare. But the media coverage was vast and made it seem like this type of thing was happening across the nation. The consequences of the coverage was that it misled audiences and created the myth that individual citizens were out of control and out to get big business. Ultimately, business needed protection from renegade consumers and favorable juries who were placing undue burdens on these business owners. The truth is that Americans are not particularly litigious, and juries typically favor businesses, not consumers, in these lawsuits. But the whole narrative became the backdrop for a tort reform agenda that ultimately limited consumers' ability to hold corporations accountable for, the mis for their mistreatment or bad products. This example doesn't highlight fake, a fake story, but rather an exaggeration and a frame that impacts the way we think about issues. In the 1990s, political actors were recounting this narrative as a way to pass legislation favorable to big corporations. I posit that the subtle manipulation of truth may be more dangerous than outright lies. I have some examples of lies, though, too. In 1980, Janet Cook published a story in the Washington Post, you may have heard this, that centered on Jimmy, an eight-year-old heroin addict, in an effort to humanize the drug crisis and put a face to systematic issues of poverty, race, and class that were plaguing the US in the late 1970s and early 80s. Her story was powerful, and it served its purpose to make people pay attention to the crisis. The problem, however, was that the story wasn't true. After Cook won the Pulitzer Prize, the truth was uncovered. Jimmy was fiction. The story was a fake. In 1996, a UK media outlet faked a documentary about Colombi Colombian drug smuggling. In 1997, there was a fake story about male prostitutes. In 2003, Jason Blair of the New York Times became famous for plagiarism and journalistic fraud. And more recently, stories that state that Melania Trump had once been a prostitute and that Hillary Clinton supported a sex ring in a pizza joint. This is all fake news. They served a purpose politically, they reinforced what people may have been hoping for, and they fit a political narrative. In each of these cases, stories were fabricated and sold as truth, and the speed of, news, the, speed of the news cycle and the time frame for spreading, spreading the information is really fast. Now, today, the term fake news is being used by both the left and the right, but more often than not, the term is really calling out journalistic bias, not factual inaccuracy in reporting. The number of things happening in the 1990s changed the media landscape and news delivery. The rise of cable television and the introduction of 24-hour news, thank you CNN, and a decline in newspaper readership, the growth of alternative news sites, and the beginnings of the new frontier of the digital age all became catalysts for the type of news we now have. More cable stations demanded content and new genres became popular. The Daily Show debuted in 1996 and set the stage for media criticism that spoke to the frustration with mainstream news coverage that had become adverse to in-depth reporting and thoughtful journalism. Satirical newscasts, including The Colbert Show, took the topics of the day and shared perspectives by poking fun and making things up. By 2004, a Pew study suggested that satirical news was central to how young people got their information. In fact, Half of people under 30 reported The Daily Show as their primary source of election news. 
That was between Bush and Kerry. This fact alone made people nervous. Because how could we trust fake news to provide crucial information to inform the electorate? Sarcasm is not news. It is not true. But in fact, audiences were gathering truth from this experience. The late night comedy shows were providing consumers with a connection between ideas. Even though sometimes they were making things up, the truth was more apparent in their satire than in the mainstream outlets. In commenting on, commenting on the state of journalism, Stephen Colbert proclaimed, it used to be people were entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. But now it seems that people have their own facts. Um, people seek news and information that aligns with their political viewpoints. And so there is a, a distinction between believing someone's opinion and taking the place of facts. For many decades, politicians have objected to mainstream media coverage of their, initi of their initiatives of their personalities, of their success or lack thereof. But Trump and his administration's criticism of mainstream journalism has been unprecedented. It has become routine for them to label critique as fake news. And that's just not true. The tension between media and politicians is a trademark of a healthy democratic culture. But Trump's deployment of fake news accusations as a way to disrupt criticism is something new in American politics. For example, when CNN and BBC were banned from the press room while, Stephen, while Sean Spicer was Trump's communication director, some feared that this bordered on censorship. The antagonistic relationship the current administration has with the elite media is part of a wider global trend that demonstrates a loss of trust in institutions broadly, government and media alike. And this is in the context of rising populism in the US and countries around the globe, including Western Europe. Social media platforms have been a breeding ground for what appears to be truthful, but is completely fabricated by anonymous agents hiding behind screens. The propaganda and disinformation campaigns fuel the anti-elite rhetoric that is persuasive to Trump supporters who have a genuine lack of trust across institutions. This media manipulation is used to increase the distrust in journalism, and it's part of a political strategy. Brian McNair, an Australian journalism scholar, offers that the old left critique of dominant ideology has been co-opted by the populist movement to destabilize the long-established norms of truth, objectivity, and accuracy in news, and in the process, hopes to replace it with what they see, to, hopes to replace what they see as the problems of, of elitism in both the left and the right. If we lose faith in journalism's ability to provide accurate information, then society is primed to accept whatever, whatever information aligns with their current belief system. And some of the wealth, wealthiest and most powerful people in the world have come to see the media as an oppressive, anti-democratic force acting against the interests of the people. I don't believe that to be true. I think good journalism exists, and I believe that we can successfully find sources that provide good reporting. But that's not what's likely on your Twitter feed. So as more and more people turn to easily manipulated, manipulated digital sources, how can we better prepare ourselves to judge what is in the service of the public good? What is good journalism and what is true? A study from San Stanford suggests that we can teach people how to better judge information they read. We can corroborate stories through various sources, determine who is behind the information, and look for evidence of the claim. We need to support public and alternative media sources. The economic model of mainstream media is a challenge to good journalism. When news becomes a commodity, it becomes vulnerable to market forces. And we've seen evidence that the news that sells is not necessarily the news that will offer stories that are most relevant to civic life. This is um, almost tangential, but I promise it's related. So Dr. Moran, you mentioned um, really briefly um, the idea that, that this democracy is functioning um, under the assumptions of deliberation, the idea that like debate allows truth to come forward um, with all of the free information that is foundational. Um, if that is the case, if that is one of the foundational assumptions of this democratic republic, um, are there spaces in the current political landscape for that discourse to happen? Is, is that, that quote unquote deliberative democracy, that really unique little thing, is that occurring um, in the political landscape separate from, from journalism and from news sources and more in that deliberative sense, like do those spaces exist? Are we seeing those conversations happen? That's a hard question to answer. I mean, I would hope so, right? That, I mean, I really feel like the um, kind of mainstream political coverage of the lack of deliberative democracy is 
sensationalized in itself, right? And so when people get together and have conversations with each other, like that's where it's happening, right? I just had you know, my, my book club last week, and you know, half the conversation was about politics, and right? So, so groups of people in small spaces getting together and having those conversations is not sexy, right? It's not what media is gonna cover. And so I am hopeful, right, and optimistic that those things are occurring. I think even within the media sector, I think there's places where you can find really good information. Um, it's just, you just have to look for it, right? And, and I do believe that, you know, as a result of some of this deliberative action, particularly among young people, that there are places even online where information is accessible and people are having nice, deep, real conversations with each other, um, even if they don't see each other. And I think that it's just a matter of an intention on the part of a citizen to go seek out information in different areas. And that's what I, like, that's what I hope for, is that people do a little bit more work to find out information. I think one other thing that's happening in, in our media is we have, for a lot of reasons, moved, we've challenged the idea of objective journalism. And there are still some newspapers of record, like the New York Times, who I think do a good job of just not, not only giving us the story, but showing us their sources and giving us the background and allowing us to judge have they done an adequate job there or not. But I think most of the media is headed in the other direction. And is that a bad thing or a good thing? Well, the corporate ownership of media and the consolidation of media into fewer and fewer hands, if that doesn't worry you, I don't know what will, because that is a problem. But on the other hand, online, I mean, and, and it comes with its own problems too. Anybody can have a podcast. Anybody can become a journalist. And, and that counts for Julian Assange too. Uh, he's never going to work for the New York Times, but he certainly has a global audience. Uh, it doesn't mean that he's objective. He certainly is the first to say he isn't. Uh, he's got his own problems, and it's a long list of problems. But it, it, the fact of the matter is he does have his sources, and he reveals his sources and, and kind of lets the chips fall where they may. Where American journalism might be headed is where British journalism has been all along and our colonial journalism was. It's just unashamedly partisan media. And, you know, again, is that a bad thing? I don't know. If you don't buy into the whole idea that there is such a thing as objective journalism, then it's overdue. Uh, but if you do like the idea of objective journalism and, and reporters who will go out there and write the stories it is, not as they want it to be, that's, that's a problem.